So I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, essentially my, my full title here at uh, East Hill Physiotherapy is physio assistant. So, which is going to sound a little bit uh, strange because why I'm physio assistant presenting to you on tendons. Um, I'm basically I've been trained in Australia and I'm still undergoing my Canadian registration. So I've been an Australian physio for over 15 years now. I graduated uh, University of Canberra in 2008 with a master's of physio, worked for about five years and then undertook further training and uh, did a master's of musculoskeletal and sports and exercise physiotherapy. And I've had, I think with the tendon stuff, I've had the luxury over the last decade or so, or even a little bit longer, especially since I did my master's, to have access, both work with and do courses from some of the really, really prolific tendon researchers over the years. One of the ones we're going to chat some of the research a little bit tonight actually comes from one of my mentors and supervisors in Australia. So I do think Australians are really pushing uh, and leading the way in tendinopathy. So hopefully everything I've gathered over the last 15 years of being a physio, we're going to distill in tonight. I'm going to try and make tendon stuff as simple as possible. We will touch on a few things there, but um, otherwise we're going to get straight into it. So hopefully everybody's okay with being uh, having a lecture from a physio assistant tonight. Okay, otherwise you can just direct Chris, uh, any questions to Rob and Chris, okay? All right, so let's go. We are going to start right off the bat with a poll. Do people know what a tendinopathy is? Because you hear all sorts of different terms, okay? So what we're going to do is launch a little poll here. There'll be, Chris will run this in the background, and what we want you to do is just put your vote in for what you consider a tendinopathy is. Okay, and then we'll get the results of the poll and we'll talk through some definitions. This is what we're going to cover tonight, and I'll come back to the definition, I promise, okay? We are going to cover what a tendinopathy is. We're going to do, even though I don't want to go deep into tendon anatomy because it gets bogged down in histology and way too many chemicals, we are going to go through some basic tendon anatomy that's really important to understand what's happening. We're going to look at some of the risk factors for developing tendinopathies because a lot of these are changeable, some are not. So we really want to make sure that you guys are understanding what you can change. We're actually going to look at some of the common causes and areas that we really tend to see a lot of our tendinopathies in. A few of the myths uh, and probably what everybody's here for, we're actually going to talk a little bit about optimal physiotherapy management for tendons at the end. So, okay. So I'm going to come back to the tendon stuff, promise, okay? Essentially, for I don't, understand, don't know what everybody's uh, level of anatomy is, but essentially we're going to keep it very simple, okay? Tendon connects muscle to bone, okay? It's made of collagen. It's primarily going to be type 1 collagen. We'll come into that in a little bit because that's actually fairly important, okay? But its main role is to actually transfer load from your muscle into the joints and your skeleton to facilitate movement, okay? Now, tendons are pretty amazing structure. They are much stiffer than a muscle, okay? And when that pulls, that's what facilitates the uh, movement of our bones, okay? So they're very used to a pulling tensile load as opposed to compression, okay? Now, with an area tendon, you also have a nerve supply and a blood supply inside of that. It's not nearly as much blood as a muscle though, okay? So which is why they're a little bit slower to heal, okay? All right, so a little bit deep here, but ultimately what we're looking at here is a tendon is just a big sheath, okay? It has a coating around the outside and it just gets broken down much like a muscle does into smaller and smaller portions all the way down, right down to our fibril, okay? At the bottom, our smallest sort of unit that we look at, all right? So it's quite under important that we understand what's happening in there because what we're looking at here is in the top slide, we're seeing a nice normal tendon. This is primarily where we have our type one collagen, which is a lot more robust, okay? Everything is lined in really nice, straight parallel fibers. And that's one of the really important things we look at with tendon disrepair and dysfunction as we come down to it. Where the bottom slide, hopefully you can see, it's a lot messier. It's not as organized, okay? You see something happening there with a different change in our collagen, which is going to be our type threes, okay? It's not as robust, it's not as strong. 
But the other thing that you'll notice with our bottom tendon is that it actually has a little bit more nerves and a little more blood supply in it, which is really important. This is one of the reasons why our new, like uh, a tendon that's sore hurts is we have more nerve endings coming into that, okay? So just keep that in your head when we're looking through the stuff later on is ultimately we have a different chemical makeup and a different structure to a tendinopathy than we do to our normal tendon, okay? Okay, this is what we're talking about at the beginning, okay? These terms are often used really interchangeably, okay? And we saw someone put in about tendinitis. Tendinitis is very much a historical term. So anything like an appendicitis, okay? When you see the word itis on the end of it, essentially means inflammation, okay? But we know tendons go through a lot more than that. So if you see a tendinitis, we're talking about an acute inflammation to that tendon, okay? That inflammatory response. Now, a tendinosis is a slightly different uh, wording where we're looking at a chronic tendon condition. The common term that we will use almost all the time in the clinic is a tendinopathy. And it's a much more broad braced term that really describes any problem with a tendon. Because when you start looking at, we talk about the cellular structure of the tendon, it's not just as simple as saying there's an inflammatory response. Our muscles and our tendons both have a little bit of an inflammatory response to any stimulus we put through them, okay? So if you go for a bit of a run, you're gonna do minor damage to your muscles at a micro level, and you have a small inflammatory response for that. So it is part of a normal reaction to a tendon when it gets really out of control is when we get concerned with it. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So you'll hear a lot of people using the term tendonitis, but we tend to prefer tendinopathy. It's a little bit more broad and it gives us more scope to work with, okay? All right, risk factors, okay. So we're talking about intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors. So intrinsic ones, unfortunately, are the ones that are a lot, you can't really change them, okay? We have a big list of them there. So any of your systematic or systemic diseases, we have a few listed there. Hyperlipidemia, metabolic disorders, we know that diabetes has a big impact on our tendons, okay? Any inflammatory conditions. If you have a family history, age, weight, all those kind of things. If you're hypermobile or conversely hypomobile, you don't move as much. If you're really weak and deconditioned, okay, you have poor muscular control, okay? And if you have an altered tendon structure, those are intrinsic ones. Those are the ones that we really don't have as much control over. They're harder to change. But with our extrinsic risk factors, these are the ones that we can, as physios, make a much bigger uh, change to. And these are the ones as patients, this is where you can actually start to make changes, okay? And this is where we're going to talk about it tonight. So overuse, I tend to, if you, anybody's been treated by me, I tend not to use the term overuse a ton. I tend to talk about the next bullet point, which is sudden change. So one of our physios in Australia is an elite level runner, for example. She's used to running 150 to 200 kilometers a week with no issues. Now, if any of us probably did that, okay, that would be considered overuse. Her body is used to it and very robust. So I tend to prefer talking about these increases in activity, which is the second bullet point, as opposed to overuse. It's more about how we get there than how much you do, okay? So when we start introducing new activities, which is the third point, that's where you're ultimately looking at that sharp increase, okay? Not giving yourself enough recovery. Lots of office workers, mechanics, anybody doing really highly repetitive jobs. Once again, that can be a risk factor, okay? Ergonomics, the literature is a little bit up and down about that, but ultimately we do want people taking breaks with good work uh, ergonomics. And there are some medications uh, that do impact um, tendinopathies. So have a look at that. We have our uh, our fluoroquinols. And uh, if you're looking at doing HRT, postmenopause, something like that, uh, can have impact on tendons as well, as long uh, as well, well as our statins. Okay. So if those are one of the medications you're on, make sure you bring them up with your physio because that will change some of our management. Okay. So now they have kind of bored you with a bit of tendon anatomy and some of the risk factors. This is the important stuff for you guys because ultimately 
we want to know what your tendinopathy is stopping you from doing or what is limiting you from doing. So Chris will pop up another poll there. Okay, give us a little bit of uh, feedback of what actually is your tendon stopping you from, and we'll talk about a few of those things. Well, okay. activities and sport. Activities and sport. Yeah. Yep, fair enough. Ultimately, that's what you're coming to physio for. Okay. Where do people get their tendinopathies? Okay, so they do tend to cluster in certain spots. This is an article I've referenced quite a bit in this one. This is from Nature, which is one of our more prestigious uh, journals in terms of medicine and science. We see really commonly shoulder tendinopathies, tennis elbows, okay? So by strict definition, we're going to, you know, lateral epicondylalgia. Most people don't really worry about what we call it as physios but essentially tennis elbow is one of the big ones. We see hip and gluteal pain, so pain on the outside of your hip. We see patella tendon pain, which is like your jumper's knee. And we also see lots in the foot. There's two different ones you can have down there. Primarily the two major ones we see is one that is in your Achilles tendon and one that comes underneath your foot called tibialis posterior. So those are the really, really common ones. And hopefully you guys can see the numbers there. But we do know that tendinopathies represent a really, really big uh, burden to people's sport, and they're getting more and more prevalent all the time. Okay, so as people change activities, we see more and more of them. Okay, so ultimately, when we talk about tendons, okay, we want to know how did you get here in the end, okay? But as we talked about earlier, and we see in the slide here, when tendons are chronically exposed to volumes or magnitudes of loading, okay? And we talk about loading as everything you do in life. It can be as simple as getting up and just walking up and down the stairs, okay? Are you going for a run? Are you jumping? So everything that you do is what we consider loading, exercise being the biggest part of that. Whether you're sitting on it, whether you compress it, okay? Anything that's beyond its normal capacity is where they start to have trouble, okay? So it says there, they experience cumulative cycles of injury. They get the inflammation. They're trying to repair that. It leads to pain, okay? One of the things we know with tendons though, is that the people tend to come see us because they have pain, but at that point in their tendon repair, it's actually been going on in the background for quite a while. And as you looked at that tendon anatomy early on, and that's why we talk about the innervation of tendons and the new nerve endings coming in, because often it's already in a state they call tendon disrepair with nerve endings coming in where it becomes more sensitive. So often by the time you come to us, there has already been a change to that tendon, which is evidenced by the pain coming in. We commonly see it actually having a change prior to you guys having come in. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so ultimately, um, where are we after? Sorry, pardon me. There we go. Okay, so we've ultimately got our runner here, which is one of the major ones we see. And then we just thought we'd better throw a nice picture in there. So that's a picture of uh, us in the Blue Mountains climbing before we left Australia. Really common to see lots of tennis elbows in our climbers. Okay. So as we spoke about earlier, we're gonna use the term loading, which is a, just a very simplistic uh, view of exercise. But think every single thing you do during the day, uh, sport and non-sport counts as a stressor for that, okay? So what you do at work, family, recreational stuff, and your training, okay? So essentially what we're looking at is the research will suggest how much do you do in any given week compared to the week before is a really good predictor of whether we're doing too much, okay? So when we start looking at all the research, and like I said, a lot of this research is biased to Australia because simply that's what I know, but there's really good data to put out there that if we're going above 10 to 15% increase in our activity levels every week, that's where the risk gets uh, really significant. So I've got some good slides coming up to look at this. So a really nice rule of thumb is whatever you did this week, small increases of 10% are really safe, generally speaking, and really easily absorbed by our body. We can soak up that new training load and we're able to handle that without our tendons getting aggravated. Once we go past about 15%, 
the injury rate skyrockets. Okay, so what we're going to look at here is that this is one of my favorite infographics because it actually demonstrates really well what we're talking about. So this is Australian rugby data. And what you see is essentially you have the risk of getting injured versus how much people were changing their training load. So this is preseason data. So essentially what they looked at with the rugby players is anybody with our green on the left-hand side of the slide that was really consistently working out, training consistently in their off-season and not modifying their load very much, they were the ones coming back in the preseason fit, healthy, and not getting injured. On the right of our screen, you see yellow, orange, and red. Anybody that jumped up above that 15 and 20%, the risk of getting injured was just skyrocketed right up. So one of the things we want to think about is rather than thinking about exercise being detrimental to your body, muscles, and tendons, we actually want to look at exercise as protective against injury. The more consistent you are, the less likely we are to see tendon injuries. And you can see this here really nicely. This was data over three seasons with some of the rugby players. So if you take nothing home from tonight, think about consistency is probably the single biggest variable that we can do to stop you from getting a tendonopathy in the first place. Okay. All right. So, so far we've talked about tendons and in terms of what sort of aggravates them. But in terms of imaging, do we need it? Okay. So we know that we have tons of fancy imaging out there. We've got MRIs, we've got ultrasounds, we've got CTs, we've got x-rays. Okay. Ultrasounds are really nice. They can provide us with a lot of clinical information about the tendon. Okay. They can show in beautiful detail what's happening. MRIs, not bad, a little bit less so in terms of ultrasound of showing us what's going on. But as you can see from uh, Jill Cook, and we're going to talk about her and Craig Purdom's model, which is one of the major ones we use. But ultimately, none of these imaging actually give us any extra information. Okay. So when people come to us and they ask us, should I get an ultrasound? Should I get an MRI? We generally have a very sort of nuanced conversation with our clients. It tends not to give us any extra information. Okay, we're much more interested in what your current capabilities are and what your current function is. Okay, the ultrasounds are nice, but they generally speaking, they tend to confirm what we already know. Okay, we always keep it in the back of the head if things aren't going the way we want, but generally speaking, they don't actually give us a lot of extra imaging or a lot of extra information. Okay, so we talked earlier on in terms of some of the studies. Now, Coombs uh, and this one by Bissett as well at the top is one of the really major ones. I was very fortunate to have Leanne Bissett who wrote that top paper as one of my clinical instructors when I did uh, my master's of sports. Essentially what we look at when we talk about cortisosteroid injections, which are often a very first line uh, approach to tendinopathy, is you will see what we call refractory period. Your tendon will often feel better at the beginning, okay? It takes away some of that pain. And we're gonna go much more detail on this in a little bit. But what we tend to see is over time, very detrimental effect to the tendon's ability to get better and get stronger, okay? They weaken it overall, all right? So it is one of the things that we tend to stay away from is the injectables, all right? And to the point where when we look at uh, this particular study here, we had a wait and see approach, which is basically do nothing, actually had better outcomes than people that had steroid injections uh, early on, okay? So it's just something to bear in mind, okay? All right. Now, I'm not sure if people have heard of platelet-rich plasma or PRPs, which is they're really popular at the moment. Uh, there's lots of research going on in them. So we're still early days, but essentially the idea behind a PRP injection is that you're going to take out some of your own blood, you spin it, you take out the parts of the blood that are the healing factors being the platelets. And the theory is that if you inject that back into an injured area, it will help speed up the healing. Now, once again, like I said, Leanne Bissett and them did a, a lots of review on this. I, part of my master's was doing a huge systematic review on the role of PRPs into uh, tennis elbows. There's so many different protocols. Every 
doctor will use a different injection rate. Do you inject it once? Do you inject it three times? So ultimately, there's a lot of inconsistencies with the research, but grossly speaking, it didn't do any difference. It's more just money out of pocket. So it doesn't tend to speed things up at all, okay? Uh, and stem and tenocytes, which are the primary cell of tendons, doesn't seem to have uh, any benefit as well. And once again, as Jill Cook points out, it's a little bit counterintuitive in terms of provoking the tendons, okay? All right, so how do you feel about rest, okay? So I think we probably got my slide slightly back here because I think we asked this a little bit going on, but that's okay. So you'll know the answer to some of our poll questions coming up. One of the things that we see is when you rest a tendon, okay, it actually really significantly decreases our collagen formation, okay? We need that collagen formation to make a stronger, more robust tendon. So a lot of people will rest a tendon thinking, oh good, it feels better, and it will. It generally will become a lot more comfortable. It'll become more pain-free, but ultimately it deconditions a tendon and it makes it weaker overall. It makes it less robust. We get that decrease in function and it tends to perpetuate a downward cycle and making that tendon every time you try and come back to your sport, whether it be tennis or running, you then are a little bit less robust the tendon flares up more readily, okay? So rest is not a great answer for this one, okay? All right, so, All right. so I hope everybody gets this one right because I got these in the wrong order. Yeah, so feel free to pop your in there. I hope everybody's... We're getting some right in. Oh, yeah, everyone's getting the right answer. Good. All right. Like I said, we got my slides in the wrong order. I've been editing this thing for weeks, so my apologies. Obviously, didn't pick that up, but so hopefully, you can forgive me. Okay. We know that injectables and surgery and rest don't actually work very well. Okay. I very rarely see good outcomes from it. Okay. One of the big things that happens with tendons is just due to their nature, they're not a hugely vascular structure like bone or muscle. So as a result, they take a lot longer to heal, which is why people get frustrated, okay? Seek out injections or seek out surgeries. Really time and guidance is our appropriate answer there. Okay, so hopefully I'm not gonna bore you with this, okay? So we know that tendon cells are mechanoresponsive, okay? They have to have some sort of input to make them stimulate and produce collagen, which is what we're after. So essentially what we see in the top is a normal sort of tendon in green, and we have an area inside of that, which is a tendon disrepair or degenerative part of a tendon, okay? Now, this is where it's interesting because generally speaking, our entire tendon doesn't get angry. It's only a piece of it, okay? Which is really nicely represented by that green and red. The one below you can see is red, but the green's got the little black hash marks in it. That's what we call a reactive tendon. So the rest of the tendon is angry. But when we look at the Jill Cook Pertum uh, model of tendinopathy, the continuum, we have essentially three stages in a very simplistic. We have a normal tendon, we have a reactive tendon, and we have a degenerative tendon. And what we know is that a reactive tendon can still settle down and turn back into normal tendon tissue. But if that gets perpetuated and pushed further down the track to essentially that degenerative tendon, which is what's illustrated in red, that tendon in red, that part that's actually changed and gone down that disrepair and poor modeling, that can't come back to normal tendon, okay? So we can't actually now make it back to what it used to look like. All right. So that's really important because a lot of our stuff in the past used to be looking at trying to change the tendon back to its original state. And our new research suggests that we can't actually do that. Okay. But we're going to talk about how we still manage it because it actually sometimes doesn't matter. Okay. So bringing in that continue that model, hopefully you guys will have the answers for this already. already. But if we have reactive and degenerative tendons, we need to know how do we deal with that, right? So the three sort of major things that it leaves us with is interventions targeting pain, okay, which is what most people tend to come to see us for, okay? Interventions...
One is the intervention targeting structure, which you might think is a little bit counterintuitive given that we just told you you can't change a degenerative tendon back. Okay, so we're gonna go through a little bit of this, okay? Ultimately, as we said, people come to us because they're in pain, okay? And it is really important that we address that. But too often when you kind of go into physios historically, GPs, they want to take that pain away, whether that be using some therapeutic ultrasound, trying to needle it, injections, medications with anti-inflammatories, or typically progressive accumulation that is what the inflammatory response that changes things. So even if we target that pain early on, which is important to get settled down, it still doesn't help that tendon long-term in terms of becoming more robust, okay? So we have to still address the capacity part of the tendon. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, okay? So like I said, Chris told me I need to throw in some more uh, pictures. I don't think this one's me, unfortunately. I was too busy taking photos. So this is the Blue Mountains just outside of Sydney in Australia. I'm a bit tragic when it comes to my rock climbing. I've gone through a bunch of tendinopathies myself. So this is my friend Brett on a really beautiful climb in the Blue Mountains and uh, I don't know, it's one of my special spots. I love it there. So, okay. So if we don't talk about, uh, in terms of addressing pain, we want to think about function and lower capacity. So this is where you're going to come in after you've gone and played big tennis tournament, okay? Which is a good example. I play tennis once a week and all of a sudden I've done big tournament this weekend and I want to come back, uh, play that tournament and that's where a tendon flares up, okay? In the clinic, it's difficult for us to quantify that. We try and look at some of their clinical tests to decide where your level of function is at. But outside of playing your sport, can we measure you? Can you play tennis for five minutes? Can you run for five minutes? Can you do 10 minutes? That's the only way we can really measure function, okay? And it's really difficult for us to go in the clinic and take an educated guess or really gauge where your function is. So even though it's something we need to address for you guys clinically, it's often a very difficult one for us to actually assess and try and look at some of the deficits that might come along with that as well, okay? Our low capacity, are there things that predispose that, okay? So ultimately, we, we don't ignore this, but it is a very difficult one for us to address in the clinic, okay? Often when we have our interview with you, that's where we can figure out what's going on, okay? which ultimately leads us now to targeting structure. So even though I said we're gonna have a part of the tendon that is degenerative, we can't change it back. Ironically, this is the most important thing we can do is try and change the structure of your tendon. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how we do that, okay? And the tendon continuum model really gives us a framework of how to get the tendon back to its normal function, its normal structure, okay? So there's a little bit of a difference of what'll happen though, okay? So what we're looking at is if the tendon is, if someone's come in and it's still what we consider a reactive stage, we can still change that back. And that's where really good education in the beginning is gonna give you the opportunity to get that tendon settled down so that your reactive tendon, which is hopefully still in the early phases of its tendinopathy, can actually change back to a normal tendon before it goes down the degenerative pathway. So that really early intervention and not waiting in terms of hopefully this will go away, maybe if I leave it, maybe if I rest it, coming in and seeing us where we can really identify what's going on, we can make those really, really good initial changes and help you sort of get on top of it, okay? Now, typically if you've been, if you had tendinopathies in the past, Lots of your physios may be giving you something called an eccentric, okay? So it's an eccentric muscle action is where the muscle lengthens. So if you think about my bicep, concentric shortens, eccentric lengthens. Historically, we've been giving people eccentric exercises because it's the most powerful part of our muscle action. And it's based on some old studies that show some favorable results. But if your tendon is really angry, okay, it's actually going to be more irritated when you put the heaviest load through it we can, okay? So we were trying to be very careful about where we prescribe our, um, our eccentrics. And you can see from my notes there, it can be really highly provocative early on in that uh, stage, okay? Once we come into a degenerative tendon that's been there for a really long time, 
we actually have to think about a different way to manage it, okay? As we talked about, this tendon structure becomes less critical to us because I can't actually change it, okay? But what we want to try and look at, and you sort of see here, is get the tissue that sits around the part of the bad tendon to compensate for the degenerative part. So we're actually trying to take look at the volume of the whole tendon as opposed to just the degenerative part, okay? And this is a much more newer model. What we've looked at in the past is just trying to focus on the degenerative part. Now we're actually trying to look at the tendon as a whole and make the whole tendon more robust. And if you think about it this way, we're trying to build basically cross-sectional area or bigger, the whole tendon to be bigger, okay? So what we know is the tenocytes, which are our tendon cells, they actually change when you load them, okay? So if we can get them turning it over, they will actually make new collagen. It tends to be type three, which is a little bit weaker, but we can sort of make those changes in the good parts of the tendon, okay? So it's really about trying to get that correct response, okay? So when we look at this, this is what we're trying to do, okay? So I showed this with a client earlier in the week. So this is a model that we look at as the donut. So if you think of the tendinopathy being the white part in the middle of the donut, okay, the air, the hole in the center, we're actually trying to take the pink part of the tendon and make it bigger and more robust. And that's the part of this tendon cells that are still responsive to load, okay? So if we can actually get our clients stimulating those tenocytes in the good portion of the tendon to lay down new collagen, and we load that in a really graded and safe way, that's really important, okay? But what we want to do, as you can see in the second part with the, the tendon uh, arrow going into the center, we want to leave the disrepair and the degenerate part alone. We don't want to aggravate it, okay? And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about here coming up, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. I've gone through most of this, this conceptual shift. We're going away from trying to treat areas of degenerative tendon, and we're really trying to look at prevent further episodes by making that entire tendon more robust, increase its overall load capacity, treating the actual donut part of that through what we call progressive loading that's within your tendon's capabilities, and that's specific to everybody, okay? All right, so that's where we say physiotherapy can help, okay? So hopefully you guys should have a little bit of an idea of this now. So we're gonna do a quick poll. I've got a couple other quick questions coming up, but ultimately, should we be avoiding physical activity if we have tendon pain? Okay. Myth, good. Like I said, I've, I've tried to give you guys some clues of these things on the way through. Okay. Perfect. We have many answers coming through. Yeah, that, Beautiful. All, all right answers. Good. Yeah. Okay. He this is what I was hoping for. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, we don't want to rest our tendons, okay? We know they get less robust. Okay, so we've gone through all this stuff. How do we get you better, okay? So we know that every single tendinopathy comes in is a little bit different. We see clinical patterns all the time, but I have yet to see two tendons that are exactly the same. And this is why it's really important to see your physio because we have to set you up a personal approach to this and make sure that you're avoiding the things that are going to aggravate it, okay? So we know education is the first and most important part of this, okay? So if you come see me or Chris, part of, and probably even potentially the most of that first consult will be really addressing what's caused this tendon, trying to take away those aggravators, okay? And then giving you appropriate exercise. So we really want to go, what's making your tendon angry? and remove those, okay? And then try and get your appropriate pain management so that it feels more comfortable. And sometimes that can be a short course of anti-inflammatories in consultation with your family doctors, okay? But we also then wanna think about what's the appropriate exercise for you that you can do for your tendon's current capability. And even though a tendon hurts, they all have some capability and it's just really important for us to find what that level is and set it for you okay we want to map out a graded return to your sport because that's generally what people are coming in for whether it be as simple as playing with grandkids taking a dog for a walk returning to tennis going back to high-end running sport climbing okay those kind of things and you notice at the bottom the very last thing i put in there is your hands-on manual therapy 
it is ironically the least important thing that we're going to do as physios. Still important part because we can change your pain and we can make your muscles a lot more comfortable, but it's the least important part of what we do. We have to get you the right prescription. Okay. All right. So once again, coming back to the education, we really, really want to teach you how to load your tendon within its current capabilities. Okay. We also want to make sure that you're avoiding specific mo movements that we know each tendon has a certain pattern that they don't like. And you sometimes have figured that out on your own. Other times we're just looking at things like gluteal tendinopathies and going, okay, take away this activity because it tends to be a very, very reactive and irritating uh, position. And some people have figured that out. Other times it's just about giving people that uh, advice. And once again, that loading safely. Okay, we haven't talked about stretching yet. All right, should we be stretching our tendons? So is this myth or yes. fact? So feel free, pop your sensors in. Okay, is that good to go? People are starting to give their answers. All, yes, they should be stretching the affected area. And then one for no, we shouldn't. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pose, I know you guys can't answer me right now. We'll talk a little bit more about this at the end. So I've spent the bulk of my lecture talking about tendons and the tenocytes and the cells and being there, being responsive to what we talk, talk about as a mechanical loading. So I guess my question for you guys is what, what do we expect stretching to do? Okay. And there's certain tendons, gluteal tendons, Achilles tendinopathies, lateral elbow tendons where we know that actually stretching them can be quite detrimental okay and this is one of the really big things i want to talk about we actually want to take away stretching nine times out of ten in people's tendinopathies okay in terms of what it does to our tendon think of it we'll talk about it in a moment but our tendons are really meant to be pulled that's what they like tensile load okay if we stretch them Yep, we're getting some of that, but more importantly, in lots of specific tendons, we actually take that tendon and we wrap it over a bony portion of our body. And what that does is it provides compressive load to that tendon and further irritates it. So there's a little bit of this as the discretion of your physio, depending on the site, but grossly speaking, we're trying to actually avoid stretching our tendons, okay? And some very specific tendons, glutes, Achilles, and elbows are the really big ones it tends to actually be a very detrimental to them, okay? So this one I would say is actually a myth, okay? So this is some of the stuff you've probably seen in the past. Foam rolling for our glutes and up into our ITB, calf stretch, okay? Uh, foam rolling for our TFL, extensor stretches. So if you've seen physios in the past, we know that the extensor stretch takes your tendon over your elbow, wraps it over top of one of the bones in your elbow, compresses it, irritates it further. Same with foam rolling. If you're going up and down over top of that uh, bursa and that tendon that sit right over top of that bony lump on the outside of your leg, you're gonna make it angry, okay? Same with calf stretching. So if you have an, what we call an insertional Achilles tendinopathy, where it's right where it inserts onto the bone and you stretch it over top of that bony uh, prominence, that's where it gets really angry. So we actually want to try and take away stretching for most people, okay? So, when we talk about this is what we do as physios, it's about getting you the right exercise prescription, okay? It has to match what you can currently do, and then it has to be progressive, okay? And then ultimately it has to match what you need for your sport, okay? And that's gonna be very different for a runner versus a swimmer or a volleyball player, okay? So it's about addressing what your current function is, and then over the space of, generally speaking, weeks and months, tendons can take that long. If you think back to our tendon anatomy, they are not a vascular structure, meaning they don't have a lot of blood vessels. They take a long time to change, okay? So when we talk about your return to sport, that can be often, more often months rather than days and weeks. So it's something just to keep in mind when you come back, okay? Last thing we chat about is ultimately manual therapy, okay? So this is what most people think that we do as physios. And yes, this is really important, but in terms of what we do with it, we can massage, but we're not going to massage the tendon. 
that tends to irritate it, okay? We want to get into the musculature surrounding that because if that muscle is really, really tight, we think we should be stretching it, but we know that stretching can often lead to compression. We still want to try and unload that musculature as much as possible. So what we look at is going deep tissue massage work in around the muscles that attach onto that. So in an Achilles tendon off of, Autopathy, uh, tendinopathy, that's going to be your gastrox or your calf muscle and your soleus, which is the one that's below that. Deep tissue work in there can unload that tendon a little bit, okay? But we shouldn't be actually massaging into the tendon. That tends to irritate it and it also draws your attention to it more and more. So you actually become more vigilant of your tendinopathy the whole time. Joint mobilizations as well. This is another one. If you do have some altered biomechanics and some changes to your walking pattern with your foot, we can actually get into your ankle joint and we can unload some of that. If some of you have been treated by me, I use a lot of elbow mobilizations, okay, to help take some of that load and change your elbow mechanics and help take some of that tension out of your elbow, okay? And then dry needling as well. I would still argue with dry needling, we probably shouldn't be irritating the tendon. We should be working into that tight musculature as well. But there are lots of therapeutic aids we can use. And you probably notice in here, that I haven't used any therapeutic ultrasound or anything like TENS, okay? They won't tend to cause any harm. They're not bad for you, but they also don't really make any change to the tendon. And you'll notice at East Hill, everybody here is really, really big on their edu education and exercise prescription. We, prescription. we don't own a, an ultrasound machine or a TENS, right? The evidence behind them isn't great and is really poor behind uh, tendon healing. So we really wanna look at, get you guys doing the right things, load up that tendon okay so ultimately you see us we get you set up with a plan okay so in terms of exercise tips it's going to be a little bit different depending on if you're an upper or lower limb tendon so we're trying to make generalizations for this here but grossly speaking if your pain is above two out of ten that's kind of where we want to go and draw a little bit of a line in the sand going anything much above that is too much irritation to that tendon and we need to back that off okay so that's where we're trying to establish the right level for you now we haven't talked about uh how we're going to load it so we talked earlier about concentric and eccentric but if you think in terms of picking up a great big heavy box of books how difficult that is to carry that box of books from your house to the car that's an isometric load okay and what isometric just means is that your muscle is working very hard but it's not actually moving, okay? What we know is that it really stimulates the tendons, okay? Really helps them to get both settled down because it provides a pain relieving effect to tendons, right? But it also stimulates them to become more robust, okay? So we want you to keep exercising below your flare-up level, okay? So you load your tendon up with the exercises that your physios have given you. Generally speaking, or in those early phases, it's an isometric rather than an eccentric, okay? but you want to continue your sport so that we're not, if you think right back to my early slides, we have to get you back to sport at some point in time. And if we don't bring sport specific stuff in, all that's gonna happen is we bring you back in and you spike your load back up and we get back into that cyclical um, uh, rhythm again. So we really want to keep up as much sport stuff. Ah, I see it's K-tape. We will talk about tape at the end, yes. Um, but uh, yeah, we want to essentially get you exercising sport as, um, as much as we, we can without flaring you up. And we define that flare up role as two out of 10. Okay, we're very close to it. It can be different with different tendons. Okay, so we'll finish up. I, I did have the question, and we'll take some questions at the end about K-tape and I'm happy to talk about that. Our take home message from tonight, hopefully, you never ever rest a tendon. There is, I have yet to meet in 15 years of being a physio, a tendon that we cannot load. Sometimes it's extremely light, but we can load it. It's just a matter of being creative, okay? Try not to aggravate it. That's your stretching. That's your poking at it. That's your flaring up. That's your doing too much exercise in one, okay? You have to be patient, okay? Make sure you see us. We're a bit biased, but yes, I feel like physios have a really, really good understanding of how tendons work and how we get the best out of them. So come see us, we can set you up with an exercise program. And there are very, very few cases where an injection or surgery is indicated, okay? There are exceptional circumstances, but very, very few, okay? So that's the take home we want you to think about tonight. So thank you very much for that. 
um, putting up with all my, I'm a bit nerdy when it comes to tennis stuff. I do like it. So hope, hop in, what's your biggest takeaway from tonight? And I think we're happy to take some questions, Chris, and I can talk about the K-Tape one here in a minute. And we also asked about ice and heat. Ah, okay, yep. So we'll address the two of those. Uh, so let's start with the K-Tape question. Uh, I don't think I've put any K-Tape on anybody in the better part of a couple of years. Okay, uh, people that have seen me, I will use rigid tape a little bit more often. So the difference is, if people aren't familiar with it, K-tape or kinesio tape is the really stretchy stuff that you pretty much see all your Olympic athletes wearing. There is very limited evidence for it helping in our tendons. Uh, it doesn't provide typically enough support for the tendons and it's really stretchy. It does have a little bit of the evidence will suggest that it does have a little bit of ability to help take some inflammation in that out. But generally speaking, it doesn't actually make any difference to our tendons. Conversely, if you feel it's beneficial to you, it's not going to do you any harm either. The rigid tape, so people that have seen me, I'll put rigid tape on the elbows, uh, sometimes around the gluteal tendons as well. The rigid brown strapping tape, which is more historical stuff, provides a bit more support. But generally speaking, we only use that as a limited resource until we're ready to load you up more normally. The tape is an aid to help decrease pain, give your tendons the support, and largely, uh, yeah. So Robin's got a question there about stretching. We'll, we can address that. Um, but yeah, with the tape, we will use it just in a short period of time to help offload things and take pain away. Uh, typically speaking, heat or ice, almost always ice, okay? Once again, there will be an inflammatory component to your tendon, that's part of the natural process of it. If it gets out of whack, we do want to bring it under control slightly. So inflammatory response is a good thing, it does help our healing, but we want to keep it in control. So ultimately, yes, we do want to use ice rather than heat. Uh, and then the other question that just popped up was in terms of if it feels good with stretching, should we do it? Generally speaking, you can probably get away with it, but it depends on the type of where your uh, tendinopathy is. So some tendons will respond well to it. And of course, in something like this, I'm trying to cover a big broad uh, range. So it sort of said no stretching, but there will be uh, exceptional circumstances where it does feel good. Ultimately, if it's not irritating it, and it's not flaring it up and you find it beneficial, that should be fine. Okay. And when do you go from isometric to eccentric concentric loading? Okay, so I will run the isometrics very, very long. Okay, I will use them all the way through, partly because they provide a pain relieving effect to the tendon, but it also comes down to which structure we're looking at. If we think about our wrist, there's very, very few motions that we do that aren't isometric in our wrist. Okay, we very rarely use our wrist through this range, where something like an ankle is very different. When we're running, we almost always use it through that concentric eccentric phase. So ultimately, what I'm looking at is trying to use, if you think back to our tendon continuum, I'm trying to make a bit of a judgment call as a clinician of where your tendon load is currently at, and then introduce it in at a spot where I feel you can tolerate it. So generally speaking, I probably would not bring uh, a concentric, eccentric action in oh, under six weeks. I really want people to have time to make their tendon a lot more robust before we introduce that. And even then I'll bring it in in a more gradual fashion. Okay. Uh, chondroitin, uh, that type of stuff. No, the research tends to show that it's not going to make any difference. So once again, it won't cause any harm, but the research doesn't tend to support it in terms of increasing any tendon healing at this point in time. Um, if you find it's helpful, that's another one that I don't have a problem with. It's not going to cause any harm. I'm literally, when I talk to the clients about whether they should or should not do stuff, my biggest decision-making tool with that is if I believe it's going to make your tendon worse, I will try and take it away. But if you find that something like uh, the chondroitin helps, then by all means, it's not going to have a detrimental effect to your tendon. I'm not convinced it helps either, but yeah, it's fine to take. Uh, what are the questions we have? Vitamins or mineral supplements, magnesium, potassium. Yeah, I think that's going to fall under that as well. There's nothing wrong with taking them, but ultimately with tendons, because the tendon is what we call mechanico-receptive, it responds to load 
Okay. And so if we're looking at uh, the, the really big clinical studies out there, we know that PRP, which is really the, the healing part of your blood, isn't making a lot of difference. Things like magnesium, that kind of stuff really isn't making a lot of difference. You're chasing the fractions of a percent to 95 or percent or almost 100 percent with the appropriate exercise loading. Ah, Isometric holds, long duration. Typically, I wouldn't go less than about 30 seconds to make a appropriate change to them, okay? There are some clients that really struggle to tolerate that, but we can usually work around that. One of the things I do see with a lot of my clients is ultimately, the isometrics are boring. They take a long time, okay? People tend to rush them. So if you think about, if you've gone to the gym in the past, you work really hard in your working set, you need a couple of minutes to really recover before your muscles are ready to do another set. And it's the same thing with our isometrics. So if we're looking at holding it for 30 seconds, I typically want my clients to do, oh God, I would probably prefer not to go less than 60 seconds rest, but ideally up to two minutes so that your tendon has the best opportunity to suck up that load again. So, um, so that question, Debbie, don't use your oh, tendons when they're... Yep, yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm happy to take a few other questions. Uh, Super tendon attachment damage, bone erosion beneath the heel bone. Oh, okay, that's a complicated question. It depends a little bit on what the type of tendinopathy is, whether it's an insertional tendinopathy for an Achilles or it's a, what we call a mid portion, where it's a little bit higher up in the tendon. Essentially, if you probably pull at your bone enough with the tendon, you're probably not going to cause long-term damage because ultimately that is what we do every time we take a step or we run or we jump, okay? There might be potential other causes going on underneath there, things like heel spurs and that can contribute to pain and irritability. So if the tendon isn't heading in the direction we expect it to, that's where we can make a choice to have some imaging and have... Uh, an, uh, an appointment with the family doctor or physiatrist, those kind of things to see if there is something in there that does need some sort of management. So that's the thing, the individualized approach to tendinopathy uh, does matter, but no, tendons are meant to pull on bone. We do it millions of cycles through our lifetime and they're very tolerant of it. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, what do we got? Just, uh... Oh, yes, so yes, to be clear, I would look at one isometric hold for at least 30 seconds. I will push people up to 60 or 90 seconds, depending on what I think their demands are. I would look at doing essentially a one to two minute rest, preferably two, and repeating that about five times, okay? Sometimes people can handle a bit longer, some people a bit less, but I try and get, essentially what we're trying to think about is how much time is your muscle and tendon complex working, okay? The longer it works, the more load we put through it, the more it can change. But that's very individual. Any other ones I've missed there? Yeah, lots of great questions, and uh, yes, yeah, nobody else seems to be coming through. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So don't hesitate to phone the clinic or email us as well. I didn't put my email on there, I apologize. Uh, but I'm Sean, what am I, Sean? Dot yeah, sean.easthillphysio at gmail.com. Uh, and like I said, just you have to ask for your physio assistant because I'm not registered yet. It takes forever. Okay. Uh, but everybody here is good at managing that. And thank you very much for your time. And uh, yes, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I enjoy this stuff. <laughs>